Welcome to This Academic Life, episode 51. This episode is sponsored by the Academic Life Faculty Development Workshops, a series of free in-person and online events that are designed for those already in or seeking to enter academic careers in STEM fields. The next workshop will be in person on April 22nd, 2023 at Boston College. If you're interested, please find the details of the workshop and the registration links in the show notes. Hi, my name is Kim Michelle Lewis. I'm a professor of physics and associate dean of research. Hi, my name is Pani Anual. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering. Hi, my name is Lucy Zhang. I am also a professor of mechanical engineering. Welcome, everyone. In this episode, we have the entire leadership team of the Academic Life Faculty Development Workshops here with us today. In case you missed it, in episode 50, we introduced our partners from the Academic Life Workshops and talked about the unique format and topics that they have developed for the series. Let's hear from the whole team so we can learn about who they are and where they're from. Hi, my name is Pamela Abshire. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering and the Institute for Systems Research at the University of Maryland College Park. I'm Jennifer Blaine Christen. I'm an associate professor of electrical engineering at Arizona State University. Hi, I'm Nicole McFarlane. I'm an associate professor at the University of Tennessee Knoxville in electrical engineering. Hi, I'm Myra Marcus Amari. I'm an assistant professor of the practice at Boston College at the computer science department. And I'm Steve Centuria. I'm an emeritus professor of electrical engineering from MIT in Cambridge. I'm delighted to be here and I'm happy that we have the whole team here today. Thanks everyone for being here. In this episode, we dive into the topic of power and plagiarism. We understand that your team will be performing a dramatization for us on this topic in the context of peer review. Could you say a few words about this general topic and how peer review is related to power and plagiarism? Well, I spent 17 years as an associate editor on two different journals. And typically it's the associate editors who manage the peer review process, selecting reviewers, evaluating reviews, making editorial decisions, and dealing with authors who may be asked to revise their work before publication. A key point is that the choice of reviewer is up to the editor in charge of the paper and the reviewers do their task under the cloak of anonymity. We thought that creating a dramatization would take the lid off that process. So you guys call this episode power and plagiarism. Why these words? So it often happens that a senior person with a big reputation submits a paper and the best reviewer is someone very junior. This certainly has happened to me when I was a new faculty member. I would be asked to review papers from leaders in the field. Even though the process is supposed to be anonymous, there is an implicit power imbalance in this situation, and a young reviewer tends to proceed with caution. It becomes particularly difficult if the paper has a serious weakness, in which case the reviewer should recommend rejection. A junior person might be afraid to do that. And that's what we wanted to capture in this episode. And it turns out that Steve's novel, One Man's Purpose, in that novel, there was a perfect example of these two problems. So our team urged him to write it up as a dramatization. Who are the different characters? There are five roles. Martin Quint is a professor and the associate editor in charge of the paper. He will be played by Steve. His assistant, Felicia, is played by Nicole. Wolfgang Schultz is an industrial leader and the author of the paper in question. He will be played by Jennifer. So when you hear her, imagine uh, a dominant male voice speaking. <laughs> S.J. Ramirez is the junior faculty person who is asked to review the Schultz paper. She is played by Myra. Nicole will also play Professor Ramirez's department chair, Richard Pulaski. And to set the stage, I'll serve as the narrator. So if the time is right, we can proceed. All right, let's hear it. Thank you. 
Martin Quint, Professor of Electrical Engineering at the Cambridge Technology Institute, is at his desk. His assistant, Felicia Albright, comes in holding a manuscript that had been submitted to the Journal of Semiconductor Materials Technology, for which Martin served as one of the associate editors. This just came in. It's from Wolfgang Schultz. Let me know who you want for reviewers. We should get it out today as I'm off to the Cape for the rest of the week. Felice waited while Martin scanned the paper, noting the subject and especially looking at the reference citations. Well, it's clear that Phelps from Purdue should be one reviewer. He knows this stuff and I haven't used him in a while. For the second review, let me, let's try locating this S.J. Ramirez, who Wolfgang cites in reference three. I'm guessing he's the Ramirez at Texas A&M and he'd be good, uh, but it also may be someone else. I'll look him up on the web. I should have it by the time you're back from lunch. When Martin returned from lunch, Felice had the cover letters prepared for sending out the manuscript. I found your Ramirez. She's not who you thought. Her name is Sue Ramirez and she's at Minnesota, an assistant professor. Should I send it? I've got her web page up. Take a look. Well, this is an interesting website. Her field looks very relevant. Sure, send it. A few days later, Martin is at his desk when his phone rings. He waits for Felice to pick up. She calls in from the outer office. It's Professor Ramirez at Minnesota. Wants to talk about the review. Martin picks up the phone. Hello, Professor Ramirez? Yes, this is Martin Quint. What can I help you with? It's the review you asked for. I cannot do the review. Really? What's the problem? Um, Dr. Schultz, he copied my results. You mean he took results from the paper he cited? No, from a different paper. I gave a paper at the Semiconductor Materials Conference three years ago. He was there. He even asked the questions. So perhaps he missed the citation. I'm sure he would correct it if we tell him. No, the problem is he used my equation. If he cites me for the equation, the paper has no original content at all. Ah, uh, this sounds difficult. Listen, Professor Ramirez, I would very much like you to do the review and say in writing what you just told me on the telephone. But he will know I am the reviewer. The paper is not in a journal. It's only out as a conference paper. He's a senior person. I'm only an assistant professor. I see. Perhaps I do need to find another reviewer. Tell me, can you think of a more senior person who was also at that conference session? Maybe I could get one of them to do the review. Mm, Anderson, Anderson from UCLA. He was there. And the Coltec guy too. His name starts with a K. Copen, is that it? Yes, Copen, him, exactly. Great, thanks so much for your help. But one important thing, please email me a copy of that conference paper. I need to see everything myself. Um, I will not do anything that will allow Dr. Schultz to learn your identity. Thanks very much for bringing this to my attention. Martin sent review requests to both Koppen at Caltech and Andres Anderson at UCLA. The response from Koppen was what Martin called a no-op, a bland review with no useful information, just a few minor suggestions for modification. It did not answer Martin's concern. Schultz sent Martin an email asking why the review was taking so long. It was only four weeks since sending the review request to Anderson at UCLA, but Martin, in response to the inquiry from Schultz, sent an email. Andres, I know we sent you the Schultz article only a short while ago, but it's kind of a touchy review, and I was hoping you could do me a big favor and get to it fairly quickly. A question has been raised about the originality of the formulation. Schultz is hot for an answer, so I would really like you to, your take on that. Don't worry about commas and periods. We already have enough reviews on that stuff. Thanks in advance. A few days later, Martin received Andres's response as follows. Martin, finally looked at the Schultz article. Funny you asked about it. I recall something very like this from a young woman at a conference a few years ago. Don't remember her name. Do you know about this? 
Martin suggested Andres take a look at the abstracts from the specific conference Professor Ramirez had mentioned, but he didn't mention her name. Several days later, Martin received another email from Andres. Found it. The woman's name is Ramirez from Minnesota. Schultz was there that year. I know because we were both trying to recruit the same PhD candidate for a job, and he was very aggressive. He won. I'm pretty sure he would have been at Mrs. Ramirez's talk, although I don't remember. Anyway, in light of Ramirez, the Schultz paper has nothing new, but it's a bit awkward since apparently Ms. Ramirez hasn't published this stuff in a journal. I just sent in my review to the journal website, and I do mention the Ramirez paper. Martin, in light of Andres's review, sent a rejection letter to Wolfgang Schultz. Two days later, his phone nearly bounced off the hook. Martin, what is this garbage? Not original? That's garbage. So, Ramirez didn't do that stuff. I cited what he did as background, and then I presented the new stuff. Actually, Wolfgang, he's a she, and it doesn't appear to be garbage. As you saw from the reviews, one of the reviewers was at the conference where she presented virtually exactly what you have in this paper. Well, did she ever publish it? How the hell am I supposed to know about a conference paper? Look, Wolfgang, here's the problem. It's not a question of whether you knew about the conference paper when you submitted the manuscript. No one is accusing you of anything like that, so please calm down. But the fact is that Ramirez presented virtually identical work at that conference, and at a minimum, you would have to cite her. But what the reviewer said, as you saw, was that if you do revise the manuscript and include a proper cite to Ramirez, then there isn't enough original stuff left in your manuscript to warrant publication. Well, who the hell is this Ramirez anyway? A woman? It wasn't the Texas a and Actually, no. When the reviewer raised the question and cited Ramirez's conference paper, we looked her up on the web. She's at Minnesota. I contacted her and asked her for a copy of the paper, which she sent so we could compare. It seemed important to do that, given the review. My God! Martin, why didn't you send me a copy of Ramirez's paper? Along with the review, you owed me at least that much. I thought we did. You're, you're right. I, I'm sorry. I, I should have sent it. And I will send it right away. I, I can't believe you would go to this kind of trouble to shoot me down. Why, Martin? Good grief, Wolfgang. You think I'm trying to shoot you down? That's nuts. I don't shoot people down. But when a reviewer raises questions, I have to figure out what to do. It, it seemed that finding Ramirez and getting her paper was required by the circumstances. What else could I do? What would you have done in my situation? Well, well, if you put it that way, I, I guess you did the right thing, but it feels strange. Was she the reviewer? Absolutely not. Schultz complained to the journal's editor-in-chief, who collected all the materials from Martin's review process and, after his own examination, concluded that the Schultz paper should, in fact, be rejected. He complimented Martin on his delicacy in handling the case. A month later, Martin attended a conference where he ran into Richard Pulaski, chairman of Ramirez's department at Minnesota. Richard, can, can we chat a minute? I have a nagging worry about one of your junior faculty, this S.J. Ramirez. She's super. We're delighted to have her. What's the issue? Well, you may know that I'm one of the editors on the Semiconductor Materials Journal, and I had a run-in on a paper with Wolfgang Schultz. You know who he is? I've heard the name. He's an in industry, yes? That's the guy. Manages research at one of the chip companies. Well, Schultz submitted a paper that I had to reject because your professor Ramirez had presented the same stuff at a conference several years ago. I had asked her to do a review, but she wouldn't do it because she was afraid of calling out Schultz. She sent me the backup materials, but she was not the reviewer who rejected the paper. Schultz raised a huge stink and probably blames Ramirez for the trouble, even though she did exactly the right thing. It's not like it was an earth-shaking paper, but Wolfgang hates to lose at anything. It's an ego thing. And when he's fired up, it's a, he's a bit unpredictable. So what can I do about this? You want to talk to her, by the way? I think she's here this week. I might like to meet her, but that's not the main thing. When does she come up for promotion? 
We go out for letters this fall. She's a shoe in based on everything I hear. Let me just ask that you not write to Schultz. It might cause trouble for her. I'd feel terrible if something I did as an editor ends up kicking her in the teeth. <laughs> I guess we do things a bit differently at Minnesota. We always ask a candidate if there are individuals we should avoid writing to. My guess is that she will mention Schultz and we will honor that, so don't worry. But as these things go, Professor Ramirez did not mention Schultz at letter writing time. So months later, Martin got a call from Richard Pulaski. Hello, Richard. How's our friend Ms. Ramirez? That's why I'm calling. I remember you saying something about Schultz last spring. Am I remembering correctly? Yes. I wanted you to know about the run-in between him and Ramirez over a journal paper. Schultz had tried to publish Ramirez's earlier result. She tipped me off, I got another reviewer, and then Schultz blew up. What happened? Well, she did not list Schultz as someone to avoid. And when the list of letter writers looked a bit thin, I made the mistake of including Schultz and he wrote a totally toxic letter. Would you be willing to write to me outlining the events? I'm going to need to build a box around the Schultz letter. Sue Ramirez is a good colleague, and I do not want this promotion to fail, especially when she did exactly what we would want every faculty member to do. After a nervous fall semester, nervous for Professor Ramirez, for Richard, and for Martin, she did get her promotion, Schultz's ire notwithstanding. The end. Thank you so much. So I was wondering that these things, they happen quite often in academia. So what's the responsibility of senior faculty in protecting junior faculties? Do they need to watch over their shoulders all the time or they should just be selective and help them in special situations? My view of this is that the senior faculty and an institution should protect junior faculty at their institution as if there was an assault going on because there are so many things that can burden an, a junior faculty person. The senior people should try to help them. But this example that we dramatized for you involves a junior faculty person at one institution and a very senior person at another institution who has no knowledge at all of this individual. And that creates a big disconnect which can create problems. I agree that senior faculty should protect and mentor and nurture the junior faculty in their departments. I have seen this taken a little to a bit of an extreme end though. So you know, oftentimes if you're putting together a group thing, you might wanna leave the junior faculty out so as not to tax their time but also sometimes it's important to include them so that they get the experience of learning how to build a group, learning how to build a coalition, doing the things that they're going to be doing independently on their own in a few years time. That's not to say that you shouldn't at, at all costs protect them from toxic behavior when you observe it in the field. My question is, it happens so often. I'm sure many of us here today have experienced it one way or another, maybe not to that extreme, but certainly at some level. So how far should you take it? I mean, in this case, it went to all the way to the tenure promotion case. What if it's just a regular presentation? Maybe it's not necessarily even a, to get into the level of a journal paper, if you see another copy of a presentation that copies another faculty's work, is that considered as a plagiarism or is that something more forgivable? If I saw that and I noticed it, I would ask about the, the, the provenance of the material. Um, and I certainly have been in presentations where I saw my colleagues including my figures without attribution in their presentations. I've been in that situation as well, having someone present my results without attributing it to my work. And at the time, I was very, very junior. And this was somebody who is at a very high position at my university. You know, so I kept my mouth shut. But that's in part why I feel so strongly now that I'm more established, that it is something I take on as my own responsibility to shield junior faculty from that type of behavior. I had a wild example of this. I went to a conference and saw my results being presented by somebody else while I was in the session. And I 
asked the individual about it. And he said, oh, you seem very upset. I said, yes. End of that statement. Some years later, this individual was nominated for an award. And the award in group wrote to me and asked my opinion. Enough said. Payback time. <laughs> I actually had a similar situation where I wrote a proposal with a collaborator whom I considered as a nice colleague. And then about a year or two later, the proposal did not get funded. I was reviewing a paper. And in this paper, I thought, wow, this person writes like me. <laughs> so I said, you know what? Some of the concepts are exactly like the one that I had presented in the proposal that never got funded. So I went back to my proposal, word for word, the entire two, three pages of introduction was coming from that proposal. And majority of that part was written by me. That's how I recognize the writing. So I was in a position where the proposal is not published and I trusted my colleague. I debated and then I confronted him. And I said, what's going on? I'm looking at this word for word copied from our proposal. He blamed on his students. That's what he did. He blamed, he said, I will talk to my student, but I said, it has your name on it. What were you gonna do? You have to take some responsibility. I don't think that paper got eventually did get published, at least from the version that I reviewed. I think they resubmitted somewhere else later on. But I did tell him if it does ever appear in a journal paper, I want that entire part to be rewritten. If it's not reviewed by me, I want that entire part to be rewritten. And then he said, I apologize for the for the inconvenience. <laughs> That's the classic take number one. I think I saw I saw several heads nodding because that is the classic response to why did you use my data without my permission? <sighs> Yeah, blame it on a student. Why not? Yeah, speaking of students, actually, I had a similar experience with a very, very, very senior person and very well-known person in our field that it happened that I discussed this topic of my PhD student and the topic of the research of my PhD student with that person in detail. And it was on Friday, we had a group meeting. My student said that the paper is ready to be submitted. And he told me, but I can't believe the same exact paper just been published by that group. The same exact name that we picked for our article was in there. And he lost that paper. He couldn't do anything because we talked about the whole detail of the research throughout uh, like one year conversation. And that person was supposed to serve as a committee member of this PhD student. So it cost the student a paper that he worked really, really, really hard uh, on it. There are consequences for the students as well. And in that case, my student, he had one less paper. Yeah, well, the example that is in our little dramatization, it's not clear that it's plagiarism. It could have been an innocent error. But the thing you just described, Panya, is theft. And the professional societies, the IEEE, the ASME, you know, all of the different professional organizations have standards and have appeals committee, committees to which you can bring a complaint if you have one. And one of the things that I tried to do as an MIT faculty member was actually to run a little seminar on research ethics, especially around the issue of publication and credit, to try to encourage our graduate students to know what their rights are and what the wrongs are, so that when they get ready to put something out, they feel confident that they're doing it well and that they have defenses in case someone does something bad to them. This is one of the reasons that. I recommend that people who present conference papers also rather promptly thereafter submit a paper to a peer-reviewed journal 
so that there's an archival, uh, searchable, documented location for the material. Conference proceedings are very hard to index and locate, and journal papers are much better for that. So another issue is the tenure letter. It highlights the vulnerability of junior faculty with the current approach to how tenure letters are selected and solicited, which is based on reputation and assessment by an expert in the field known to members of the community without reference to or understanding of the professional behavior standards of those experts. What are your thoughts? Should we reconsider how tenure letters are requested in any of these cases? I think that most institutions do give junior faculty an option to explicitly list folks who should not be considered for writing letters for them on their behalf. And I think that junior faculty members are always well advised to list any sort of senior folks in their field with whom they've had conflict. And that was the primary error by uh, Professor Ramirez in our dramatization. Yes, it's, a, it's actually a very complicated problem, selecting individuals to write. You want to get an honest evaluation at, for promotions. And so you want to offer the cloak of anonymity to the individuals who are serving as references. And at the same time, you hope that these are people who are going to give you an honest judgment and not go on an attack that's not justified on the basis of facts and record. I have personally experienced the case where an individual in industry wrote a toxic letter for one of my colleagues in my department. That's the model for Schultz. <laughs> he did it and he did it nastily. And it took a lot of work to build a box around it to show that this was a spiteful letter. And even though it had to be submitted as part of the tenure package, you created defense around that letter because it could do so much harm. And the interesting thing is that reviews of journal papers are exactly the kinds of things that can create the animosity that results in people writing nasty letters, which is why we took the trouble to include it in this little event that we did for you tonight. Are there any thoughts that we could give to senior faculty and junior faculty? Junior and senior faculty should ask graduate students and postdocs to attempt a review of a paper that is then reviewed by the mentor of the individual so that people learn how to do reviews while they're still very junior and learn the strategy of commenting on papers and, and criticizing papers. That doesn't guarantee that someone isn't going to steal your stuff. To prevent people stealing your stuff, you have to publish it. You have to get it out there. But at least a senior faculty person can really help the entire publication process by encouraging junior people to participate in it without putting them on the line, sort of a training run. Wow, that was a very exciting discussion. Thank you all so much. We hope our listeners were able to follow the story that the team presented to all of us and had a chance to think about how you would respond to these questions if you were a character in the play. If you have any comments, thoughts that you would like to share with us, please do write to us and let us know. If you attend this workshop in Boston College on April 22nd, 2023 in person, you will be able to participate in a live discussion with many like-minded people. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. You can follow us on Facebook and listen to our latest episodes on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, or Google Podcasts. If you're interested in being a sponsor, then please contact us at sponsor at thisacademiclife.org. Join us next time for the good, the bad, and the ugly of this academic life. <laughs>